may be seated. I'm glad that you're here this morning. Are you glad to be here? I don't think Matt was glad to be here, but I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad that you're here. And uh, it's an exciting day in our midst, and not just for any reason other than it's just fun. It's just fun. That song, I, I'm, I, I, that is one of my favorite songs. I just The truth that's found in that, if, if that doesn't get you excited about your relationship with Jesus, I'm not sure there's a whole lot that will. Um, just that, that, that truth that, you know, sin is strong, but Jesus is stronger. And shame is great. And some, some of you carry around just shame. And I want you to know that Jesus has come, and he died, and he rose again, and he can set you free from that. And, uh, and I, I just love the truth, because there's days, uh, yeah, we can, do, we can do that again. Because there, there are days, there are days when everybody in this room fails and there are some days that you fail miserably, but Jesus is better. And Jesus is greater. And that's what gives us hope to just keep going, to keep going, to keep going. So anyway, hey, if you're new or kind of new around here, I, I would love the chance to just enter into a conversation, get to know you a little bit. So if you have a few minutes after the service, if you'll head out these doors and take a right, just hanging out right there at a place we call the landing. And I'm really working to try to remember some names. So if, if you're one that I'm struggling to remember your name and you know that, extend me a little grace and come hang out with me for a few minutes. Um, I would just love the chance to hear your story because I'm hearing all sorts of stuff. We got people moving from North Carolina here, folks from Norton, New York, and all, I mean, just all over the place. So it's a lot of fun and I'm really trying to keep up. So I would love to hear uh, your story uh, with that. And so, uh, but one of the things I, I just, as we get into our message this morning, one of the things I love doing right now, it's not really a hobby, but it's just an interest of mine, is I love looking at um, businesses and particularly businesses that um, have not succeeded over, say, the last 10 or 15 years in particular. Um, businesses that some have actually just shut their doors and are no longer in existence. And I like to look back and, and, and just kind of hear a little bit of the story. I've read some of Jim Collins' books, and he writes some business books on, you know, how businesses, you know, have made it through and uh, have lasted through some of the change and the stuff that comes. And so it's just something that just piques my interest. And so I wanted, I don't, it may not pique your interest, but show, companies like Shoney's, do you remember Shoney's? There was a Shoney's everywhere you went a while ago. Everywhere you turned, there was a Shoney's. And you could go to the Shoney's breakfast buffet. Do you remember the breakfast buffet at Shoney's? That was a pretty solid deal right there. You could go and have breakfast, and it was fantastic. In fact, growing up, I, I grew up on Hilton Head, and there was a Shoney's on the island, and there was a Cracker Barrel on the island. And I used to prefer to go to Shoney's, and while the rest of my family wanted to go to Cracker Barrel. And uh, I loved to go to Shoney's. There was something specific I liked to eat, but it's not there anymore. In fact, the one on the island that used to be a Shoney's is now a Stax Pancake House. Have you ever been to Stax Pancake House? It's solid right there if you're looking for a place to go have brunch on the island before you hit the beach. That's an okay place. Um, so, but I like looking at businesses. So I wonder if you can help me this morning. I've, I've got some pictures I want to show you. And I wonder if you can identify these particular businesses uh, from actually not necessarily in our community, but actually in Savannah. Okay, so let's roll through these. This is one. Do you know what this is? Kmart. Yeah, you guys, some of you are really smart. Um, you got this. I love this picture in particular because the store actually extends a little farther this way, but you can see, I mean, all of this, and then they had the little garden center and stuff over there, and that's just fascinating when you look at um, that this Kmart was like that, and there were, by the way, there, I mean, there were thousands of Kmart stores, which is incredible to think about. Um, they, they actually, at their peak in 1994, so 1994, if you were alive in 1994, um, Kmart had 2,323 stores like this spread all over the place. You remember those? You, everywhere you went, there's a blue light special. You go shopping in Kmart, it's like blue light. You're seeing what that special is. You know, they got a little cafe or cafeteria or whatever the, the eating place was like inside there. So you'd go to that Kmart. You could get you lunch if you wanted to get lunch there. Not sure the food was all that safe to eat, but hey, we all survived. We're still living to tell the story. And so this is Kmart. Now listen, after Kmart goes through bankruptcy two different times in 2002 and then again in 2018, they went from 2,323 stores to 202. So somewhere... There's 2,100 storefronts that look like this all over the place, empty. Some maybe have been repurposed for other things. But Kmart has had a hard time keeping up with some of the changes that have come 
in our culture. Now, let's check out this store. Maybe, I'm sure you can probably get this. If you got Kmart, you can get this next one. Ready? Here we go. It is Sears. Yeah, this is recent. So if you, if you go over to Savannah and you, you go to Oglethorpe Mall there in Savannah, this is at the end of Oglethorpe Mall. It's a Sears. It's all Sears. And really the same thing happened in Sears. But here's one of the most fascinating things about Sears. It started um, where they would send a catalog. You remember those days? You'd get a Sears, and this is, this is a long time. This was like 70, 80 years of catalogs that they would have. So they'd send you a catalog, and you would order things out of the catalog. Do you remember that? Yeah. And in fact, so much so, they were setting the pace with that through, through some of their high times. They were setting the pace with, you'd get the catalog. You remember that was like, you, get, you know, the Sears Christmas catalog would come. You know what I'm talking about. If you're my age, you remember that. You get that Sears Christmas catalog. It's Christmas time because you're not ordering on Amazon and Target. That's not even around. You may have had a Walmart, but mostly it was Sears or JCPenney catalogs that you're looking through trying to find something that you're going to order for Christmas. You know what I'm saying? And then you would go and pick it up. Now, here's the interesting thing. They killed the catalog ordering center in 1993, guess what company was founded in 1994? Amazon. Sears was setting the pace for years. And all they had to do was to figure out in their business model, how do I take the catalog and put it into this thing called the World Wide Web? Right? But they, they couldn't adapt. They couldn't adopt to that. And they've gone through some different things. You know, they had this big building named for it in Chicago. It's not named for it anymore. All that kind of stuff. But they weren't able to keep up with the changes that were going on. Okay, so this was, this was cool. Um, from 2011 to 2016, they lost, get this, Sears lost $10.4 billion in five years. That's nuts, you know? I mean, that's just crazy. Anyway, so here's the next company. Ready? You probably, I know you're going to get this one because I got a clue on here for you. And it is Toys R Us. Yeah, I don't know. I think somebody stole the Toys R Us sign, and, but they didn't want the Babies R Us one. You know what I'm saying? Um, so toy, Toys R Us. Now, Toys R Us wasn't as big of a company as, say, Sears uh, and Kmart. They weren't quite that big. They had 700 and something stores in the States. They had... Uh, almost a thousand stores around the world, but we all know what happened last year, don't we? Last year in 2018, if you remember this, 2018, they shut down all of their stores in the United States. And part of that is just in, due to the fact that they couldn't see what was happening in the culture around them and then adopt to it. Um, and, and I know some people want to blame Amazon and all that kind of stuff, and I'm not trying to lay blame. I'm just saying that's part of what happens. These businesses die because they're not looking around them to see what's going on. Now, here's the, here's the challenge that comes into play for all of us, and this is where it gets really, really personal. One of the things that we don't see, but it's happening, is that every day there are churches that close their doors. By the thousands. By the thousands, churches are closing their doors, closing their doors, closing their doors, one after another, one after another, one after another. You probably know from where you used to live or where you're from or your hometown, that type of stuff, there's probably a church somewhere in that history, somewhere in that story, there's a church that has closed its doors, that's no longer in existence for whatever reason. It could be that, you know, they ran out of money. It could be that they were so resistant to change or that type of stuff that they just, they, whatever the reason, there's all sorts of reasons that it happens. But you probably know there are some that you know of, you know their story, and you probably wonder what happened somewhere along the way. Um, something got lost. And this morning, as we turn our attention to this next church in our series called Caution, um, I'm going to ask you to turn in God's Word to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, where we're going to talk about the church in this city called Sardis. And this is just six verses. We're going to run through it. I got some other things that I want to give to you this morning. But the big picture is the the idea that there are churches around us that are dying. Um, Let's not become one. It's really the big thing. Let's not become one. Because here's what happens in our life. This is this big, the big statement that I want you to think about um, this morning. And it, and it ties into what you saw in the businesses, but it also ties into what we're talking about in reference to um, this passage in Revelation. It's this. Seeking to preserve what you prefer will get you what you deserve. Seeking to preserve, trying to hold on tightly to these, uh, these things called preferences, 
Okay, and we're going to talk a little more about that in particular. But seeking to preserve what you prefer will get you what you deserve. So in the case, Sears is probably one of the, the companies that I just I, I think about as I kept reading through that stuff. To think that they killed the catalog distribution division of their company in 1993, and the next year is a company that's founded. That Granted, it's 20-something years later, but Amazon um, employs over 600,000 people around the world. And if they had just, you know, if they hadn't have held on to what they preferred to do. Another company in this is Kodak. I don't know if you're familiar with the Kodak story, but Kodak was a brand that everybody knew about. Um, they actually were the first ones that built the digital camera. They were the first ones that could house digital photos on the internet. But because they were holding on too tightly to what they preferred their business to look like, they've lost billions of dollars as a result of that. And in churches, the same thing is happening because we want to hold on to something that technically is just a preference so tightly that we're going to wind up getting what we deserve if we hold on to that. Um, And so this is about, for us, truthfully, it's about us loosening our grip on the things that we prefer in order for us to see God do something greater in our midst. And so he addresses this to the church at Sardis. So let's roll through this, okay? He says this, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. Sevenfold spirit of God, kind of this interesting reference. Um, For me, I, I look at that and I'm like, huh, that's interesting. But the idea there is that there is completeness with the Holy Spirit. Like the Holy Spirit has everything you need. He's, he's comfort, he's peace, he's convictor, he's, he's guide, he gives wisdom. All of those things in your life is the completeness of the Holy Spirit. He's everything that you need in your life. And this is one of the things that, that he's talking about. So just a reminder, and here's the other side of it. The, I believe one of the reasons that he addresses it from the Spirit of God, right? Mes- this is a message from the one who has the sevenfold Spirit of God, is this. I believe it's the Holy Spirit that's going to breathe life into our deadness i believe it's the holy spirit that's going to convict of sin in our life i believe it's the holy spirit that's going to move in our midst and i know that makes some of us uncomfortable because we grew up talking about uh, in a tradition that didn't necessarily talk about it a lot or refer to it as the holy ghost and we're not sure what to take of that and i get all that but what i want you to understand is that the holy spirit if you feel like you're walking around like a spiritual zombie the holy spirit's going to breathe life into your life okay so sevenfold spirit of god he goes on as he writes this and the seven stars i know all the things you do isn't that great guess what i know you you were mad this morning you know driving onto our parking lot yelling at your kids all that kind of stuff i get it so jesus knows he knows all that you do you can't hide anything from him you think that you're hiding you're not hiding i know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive some of you put on a really fake face this morning you did. It's like, hey, I'm great. Life is great. And it's not. Everything around your world is crumbling. And, but you, you just kind of propped yourself up like, hey, I'm doing really, really well. I started thinking about this. I know I shouldn't refer to this, but I'm going to because you're the 10 o'clock service. You can handle it. But do you remember the movie Weekend at Bernie's? Some of you are like, never heard of it. Don't watch it. It's not a plug to watch the movie. But some of you know, like Bernie died and they're trying to make it like he's alive through the weekend, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, and that's how some of you are living your life. Like you just, you're spiritually dead and you got nothing. So think about that. I know all the things you do that you have a reputation. People look at you like, oh, you're so great. And you no, you're not, but you're dead. That's the indictment coming from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that fun? Okay, now he says this. He goes on, wake up. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains. For some of you, that's this little flame this little, this little ember in your life. And somewhere it's, it's the, there used to be this great fire. It's not there anymore. For whatever reason, that, that fire has gone out. But there's something that remains in you because you still showed up this morning. And you're not even sure why you showed up this morning, but you did. Maybe it was habit. Maybe it's just a thing you do on Sunday mornings. And if, you know, church would stop changing the time that they meet, then you would finally get it right, that kind of stuff. We, but, but that's you. You're just, it's like that ingrained in you. You've been doing this for 50 years or 60 years. Sunday morning, you get up, you get dressed, and you go to church. You get up, you get dressed, you go to church. 
It didn't used to be that way, but it's that way now. And so there's this little flame. And that's, that's one of the things I love about this strength. And even if it's that little bit in your life, if there's this little ember, this little glow, you know, you've been, had a fire going before and it almost fizzles out and then you take an extra stick and you start poking at it and stirring it up and all of a sudden it starts burning again. You throw more wood on it and it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. That's sort of the picture that, that he wants you to see here. If, even if it's just a little bit, it's okay. If there's this faintness to it, it, it's okay because you can begin to fan that flame and make it come alive again. Through what? Holy Spirit. Okay, okay. Uh, for even what is left is almost dead. It's almost dead. It's not quite, but it's almost there. So wake up, he says. That's that big one. Strengthen what remains. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Isn't that nice? For some people, for some people, it's just going through the motions. That's what he's talking about. He's, he's, your actions, like you get up, you get dressed, you go to church, you go through the motions. For some, it's that I started thinking through, you, you remember James, when James wrote in his epistle, or his letter, and he says, faith without works is dead? Well, guess what? Works without faith is also dead. And so he's looking at this, and he's going, look, I find that your actions, because some of you, it's, it's actually, you're just performing some works, but you have absolutely no faith. Or you have faith, but you don't have any works. And it's like, well, that's dead too. So, I mean, that's just dead. That's not a whole lot of good going on. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. He says this now. He goes back. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Do you remember that day? You remember that day that you first believed? I remember that day for me. I remember that Jesus died on a cross for me and he saved me so I didn't have to go to hell when I died. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And man, I am grateful that the Holy Spirit through the years has just been, you know, fanning that flame in me, in my life, because that's what it started with for me. And now I can look at this song that we just sang and go, man, my sin was great, but Jesus is greater. My shame is great, but Jesus, you're greater. And I can lean into that and believe it, and it stirs something in my heart. It's like, oh, yes. Okay, so what did you believe at first? What did you believe at first? Do you remember that day? Because that's what he's calling us back to. And especially in a church where, um, this, this is a church that's probably not more than 30 years old. Um, planted maybe when Paul was around. It's a little side fruit of his planting the church at Ephesus. And this happens and this church blooms up. And at one point it was strong and it was pretty good. But this is a, this is a generation that probably came to faith in Christ um, as an adult. And somewhere they just get lost in this. He's going, look, fan into that flame that you had at first. He goes, hold firmly to it. Hold firmly to it, to what you believed at first. And then, then I love, I just love this. I know you get tired of me saying it, but repent, turn, turn away from the invitation. Repent and turn to me again. I, I just love the, the, the passage in Acts 3. Jesus, or Peter's preaching this sermon. He's talking to the people that basically put Jesus on the cross. And he says, now repent and return so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that's the invitation to all of us. All of us, it's just repent and return, repent and return. Repent, turn away from our sin, turn to Jesus, and he's going to do something with that, with our willingness to turn away from it. And I just throw this out there, and I said it last week, I'm going to say it again. When's the last time you repented of sin in your life? When's the last time that you just, you just looked inward and you asked the Holy Spirit to show you the things in your life that you needed to turn away from? What are they? And are you willing to? Because I find that most of us are not willing to, even if we know what they are. But the invitation from Jesus in this particular place is he's going, look, repent and turn to me. And he says this. Now, he goes, this is where it gets a little more of a rebuke. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as an unexpected as a thief. Have you ever been robbed? Yeah, it's not fun. Um, it's just not fun. You don't, you don't know. They don't announce it. Like, hey, I'm going to come rob your place tonight at 10 o'clock, so be ready. They show up. And that's, if you don't wake up, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. Yet, he goes on, yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. So Sardis, um, one of the things you need to know, Sardis is a, a relatively wealthy city right now. They, um, not now, but when they're writing this letter. So they're relatively um, wealthy city. Um, they had, they were able to, they, they found that gold was in one of the rivers that was nearby. And so you could go, I mean, if you needed more money, you just go and search for some gold and you go sell it. They were, uh, one of the cities that was first, the one that was, um, 
uh, making uh, gold and silver coins. They, they were the, one of the first cities that was doing that. But they also were one of the cities that had taken um, wool and they learned to dye the wool. And so this is actually when Jesus is writing this, when he's writing this letter, recognizing what's going on in the city, right? So there are some in the church at Sardis, and this particular is reference to them learning to dye the wool, who have not soiled their clothes with evil. You see, there are some, he's saying, that have not been stained by the world. There are some, he says, you remember the reference in the, in the New Testament where he says that we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. See, we all know that, but we don't live it very well. But this is what they're saying. He said, there are, there are some, there are some in the church who have, they live life set apart. Because listen, here's the thing. As a follower of Jesus Christ, your life should stick out like a sore thumb. People in the world, people who don't know Jesus, they don't follow Jesus, they're not even religious, they're looking at you like you are off your rocker. And guess what? You are, or you should be. Like you're not buying into what the world is selling. You're, 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 you're set apart, and this is what he's talking about. So there are some who have been set apart. They haven't, they haven't given themselves over to the world, but they will walk with me in white, uh, for they are worthy. And then he goes on this, this interesting phrase. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. He says, I will never erase their names from the book of life. I find this to be one of the most fascinating verses, or parts of the verse, because I don't know about you, but when I look at this, I wonder... So does he erase people from the book of life? See, you've never thought about that. I see that. And, you know, we, we teach that, you know, once you're saved, you're always saved. That's one of the things that, you know, we believe. So this, this though, looking at it, I will never erase their names from the book of life. So if you're not victorious, okay, you're not going to be clothed in white, and you are going to be erased. So what's that all mean? And, that's a tough one. I want to be honest with you. I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know if you wrestle with these things. That's how my mind works. So I'm, I'm a little crazy, I know. But I believe that this is a reference, okay? This is what I believe about losing your salvation. Um, I don't believe you can lose your salvation. I believe it's more of a question of whether you were ever saved. I think that you can fake it really, really well. Okay? I believe you can fake it really, really. You can, you, can mass, you can be like Judas. I'm following Jesus for three years. I'm even partaking of some of the miracles that he's performing. But then I decide to turn my back on him. He was never really a follower of Jesus. He just looked like he was. And there are a lot of Christians who, well, they're not Christians. There's a lot of people who look like they're Christians. They're not. And for, for what I see in this verse, it's, it's this promise instead to say, look, for those of us who are faithful, right? We are victorious. We will be clothed in white. We will not have our name erased from the book of life. We are secure because of what Jesus has done for us, okay? Now, I'm, I'm also going to throw this out there. And this is, this is you're going to think I'm nuts, and that's okay. I don't even know how to say it, but I'm going to say it. If I'm wrong, <laughs> okay, if I'm wrong, here it is, just keep following Jesus, okay? I'm just telling you, like, if I'm wrong, because I'm, I'm not God, okay? All I can do is listen, but I'm saying, and some of you are looking at me like, I can't believe he just said that. If I'm wrong, keep following Jesus, because you can't go wrong if you're going to follow Jesus, okay? You can't go wrong. You know, if you prayed a prayer when you were seven and you, your life bears no fruit of being a follower of Jesus, then I don't know if you, I don't believe you were ever saved, but listen, if you're saved, you're going to keep following Jesus. That's what I mean. So whatever, what, however the whole thing shakes out, I'm not God. I believe you cannot lose your salvation. But if I'm wrong, because he's God and I'm not, you need to keep following Jesus. Don't give up on your faith. Don't give up on your faith. Okay? Just don't do it. Because he, this is, you just got to understand that. Okay? Because I'm human. Okay? I'm human. And I didn't, I didn't make the rules, so to speak. He's God. He did. So, I, I, you know, that's free for coming today. You got it. Okay. He goes this. I will never erase him. He says, but I will announce before my Father and his angels that they are mine. I love that picture. 
to belong. Some of you are looking for somewhere to belong, and Jesus is inviting you to belong to him and his family. Isn't that great? Man, it's so much better. My family's pretty cool, by the way, but it's not nearly as good as being a part of God's family. You know, I mean, it's just that I just love this picture that I'm going to announce. Hey, Father, all the angels. That one's mine. I just want everybody to know. Just want everybody to know that Bob, Shelly, Mike, I'm not going to get all your names right. But the idea is they're mine. They belong to me. That's cool. That's cool. They are mine. And then he goes on. He says, anyone with ears to hear, must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Okay, so um, I want to share with you, so there's this guy, his name's Tom Rainer. Tom Rainer wrote a book um, called The Autopsy of a Deceased Church. And in, the, in this book, he lays out some of the foundations for churches that, that seem to be, he, he tracks trends in what's going on in churches, and um, he has a research department and that t- type of stuff at his disposal. And so, but he does this, this research, and then he compiles some data. And so, I want to share with you these 10 things that he, he wrote in this book, Autopsy of a Deceased Church. Feel free to buy it, by the way. It's actually a very good book and a very short read. So if you have on your list of things to do this year, read some books, buy this one. It's really short. You'll get through it really fast, okay? Um, I read it in just a, about an hour, so that's how fast I, I did it. But here we go. Ready? Ten things I just want to share with you real quick. First is this. One of the things that he discovered about churches that died, that closed their doors, is it started as a slow erosion, Okay, slow erosion. These are not going to come up on the screen, by the way. These are just, I'm going to say them. And if you need help at the end, just come find me and I'll tell you what they were. But it started as a slow erosion, which means that somewhere along the way, that church made a decision, but they didn't understand the consequences of it. Kind of like Sears when they bailed on the the catalog industry instead of turning that to something else. But it's just this slow erosion. Um, And then eventually it just led to a death in the church. So it was slow. You don't see these things at first. And if you're familiar with a church that has died, okay, then you know because it happened. It started like 35 years ago, but it took 35 years to die. So it was a slow erosion. Um, Number two, what he realized about churches in this uh, that that had died was this. This is is a hard one. The past is the hero. The past is the hero. It's like, it's like these people would gather together and they would talk about, hey, do you remember back in 1986? Wasn't that just a great year? You know, we had this tent revival and all this stuff happened. It was, man, that was one of the best years and it's 2006. But in the last 20 years, they've got nothing and then they've got nothing that they're looking forward into the future and they consistently go back to what happened in the past. And the past is the hero. It's that pastor or that person or that thing um, in the past. And they've propped that up and they, they've really, they've memorialized it to, for lack of better words. The past is the hero. Number three, the church refused to look like the community. This is a very tough one. We know um, throughout history, we know one of the things that happens is um, churches, as our communities change around us, the church stop, when they stop reaching the community around them, right? And the community that God has placed his people, when they stop reaching out to those people, right, then they, it looks less and less like the community. And I shared this in the first service. I want to share it with you guys today. I'll bet that it was seven years ago, and some of you can, can vouch for me on this because you've been here with us that long, but I'll bet it was about seven years ago that this church did not have a person of color in the church at all. It's one of the things, I'm I'm be honest, one of the things I'm most proud of of us as a church is the fact that we we look and we look more and more like our community around us. Because here's the thing, I don't know if you realize this or not, and I know this hurts some of you, but we're, our community around us is not just middle class white people. And there, there, there's everybody that's around us, and we want to be a church that represents our community and looks like our community. So I love the fact that we look so much more diverse today than we ever have. In the, in the history of our church. I love it. I, I think it's one of the, the neatest things that God has done. But there's a lot of churches who cannot embrace and look like their community looks like any longer. And, and that caused them um, to die. Number, th- number four, um, the budget remains inward. What do they mean by this? They mean they stop 
finding ways to reach the community. They stop giving to missions. They stop somewhere. And it happens. I mean, churches get into like 2008, um, 2009, 2010 when that economy is going on and they start thinking about it. One of the things that they try to start doing first is to preserve themselves. And when you, when you get to this place where all you're trying to do is preserve what we have, then you're forgetting, listen, here's the thing, that's the time more than any other time that the community needs the church to step into that moment. Not, not turn inward, not get to this place where, okay, we're going to stop thinking about outreach. We're going to stop dreaming about how we can step into people's lives and their story and their circumstances and offer them the greatest message in the entire world that Jesus loves them, that he came to die for them. Instead, we're like, no, no, oh, we got to keep this program going. We got to keep buying this. We got to keep doing this. this. It's like, we've, we've lost what Jesus has called us to. We've lost what he's called us to. And so, and it happens. So the budget turned inward. I actually was looking at a church the other day for whatever reason. I'm not going to tell you the church. It's actually one in our area. But they, they publish every, every week their like if people gave, they, they publish every little thing. Well, one of the line items that people were giving towards was inreach. But I didn't see any outreach. I thought, how sad that they're not thinking about how we can reach our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I hope you realize that we do have the greatest message in the world. The greatest message in the world is not that you can order something on Amazon and it get delivered the next day. The greatest message in the world is that Jesus left heaven and came to earth and he chose to be clothed in humanity and then he chose, for you and for me, he chose to hang on a cross. He chose to give his life. He chose to be buried and forsaken by his heavenly father so that you and I can be offered the forgiveness of all of our sins. The greatest message in the world is that though, although their sin is great and our sin is great and although their shame is great and our shame is great, Jesus is greater. And our community needs to hear that message, whether it's good times or lean times. They need to hear it. Okay. Um, number five leads us to this. The Great Commission is ignored. The Great Commission uh, is ignored. The way that Tom Rainer said it is the Great Commission has become the Great Omission. And see, here's, here's, this is what's going to hurt a lot of us in this room. So just go ahead and stick your foot out a little bit, and I'm just going to come right there. Many of us are not living the Great Commission. We are not living the Great Commission. We may say we believe in the Great Commission, but here's my question. Are you living a life on mission with Jesus? Are you living your life right now in a way that says, you know what? That person cares about my eternity. That person cares about the fact whether or not I have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. Are you living a Great Commission life? Because the truth of it is, if it's not in your life, it's not in the church. Because you are the church. This building, not the church. You are the church. If it's not in your life, it's a, if it's not in my life, then it's not in the church. So how are we going to step into this moment where God is calling us to live on mission with Him? To reach the people around us with the greatest message in the world. I told you that was going to hurt. You can pull your foot back in now. You're okay. I'll bring another one in just a second. Okay. Here's one. Here's one. Um, the church is driven by preference. <laughs> See, this is hard because we all have preferences. Like some of you prefer, some of you prefer donuts that are glazed from Krispy Kreme. That's my wife. Um, she prefers that. Some of you prefer um, Dunkin' Donuts. Some of you prefer iced coffee instead of hot coffee. Some, and I prefer, let me just be real honest, I prefer cream-filled donuts with a chocolate topping on them. I mean, if a donut's not filled with something, it's just not really a donut to me. That's just how I feel about it. But I'm not eating donuts right now, so that's okay. I don't care what you bring. Um, but we all have preference. In fact, I'll bet if I ask this room of 200 plus people, hey, why don't you just write down on a piece of paper, what, what song is it that you wish we would have sung this morning? And I'll bet I get about 200 different answers. Why? Because we all have preference. We all have preference. The problem is when we start living and guiding and directing based on our preference and even making decisions based on, well, I prefer this. Because there are some people in this room, you'd prefer that I preach for only 20 minutes. There are some of you that, and I love you the most. No, I'm just kidding. There are some of you that say you can preach for an hour and I'm going to be okay with that. You know, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. 
but everybody has a preference. I prefer we sing four songs or five songs or six songs or no songs at all. Or I prefer, you know, I prefer that I can park right out front or right out to the side. And I don't want to walk to church. I want to be able to park right there by the building. And I prefer, you know what? I don't want my kids to be in the building across the parking lot. I want them to be right here with me. Everybody has a preference. Get it? I get it, yeah. But you see, when you try to preserve what you prefer, you're only going to get what you deserve. And churches that die are holding on to their preferences. Well, I prefer this color of carpet. I prefer the pews instead of the chairs. And I prefer the pulpit instead of nothing. That has nothing to do with the gospel. That has nothing to do with the mission. That has nothing to do with it. We need to begin to let go of our preferences. Because there are people around us that need to hear their greatest message in the world. And our preferences will keep us from doing that. Number seven, the church neglected prayer. I just throw this out there. Listen, we're praying. I told you we're praying over some property. Come and join us. There's 500 and something adults on a Sunday morning. And we're, we're seeing about 50 coming out there. So come and, come and pray with us. That's what we're asking people to do. Come and pray. You can find out information on our website. But we're, we're trying to pray together over this. Um, number eight, the church lack purpose. Yeah, well, they're going to lack purpose if you choose to omit the Great Commission. That is our purpose. God has placed us in here, in this world, in this life, not so you can have a bigger, better house and a nicer car. God placed you here so that you can be on mission with him. Number nine, um, the church set up memorials. Or buildings, they, they treated buildings like they were memorials. I, there was a story in the book of a church that had this room, and it was a good meeting room, but because it had been set up or the stuff had been donated by Aunt Sue, you know, and it was called Aunt Sue's Room, and if you weren't Aunt Sue, you couldn't go in the room kind of thing. You guys have been in churches like that, I know. And they, but listen, I mean, let's just let's realize this, this building and what we have is all a resource something that we can leverage to be used for furthering the Great Commission. And so we're not going to set them up as memorials. And, you know, if there ever comes a day where our kids' ministry needs this building or something like that, then we're giving it up. (laughs) I just throwing it out there. Like, we're we're not going to hold on too tightly to to all this stuff. Um, And then number 10, which didn't necessarily apply to us, but I just wanted to, it, it, the, pastors had short tenures and so the pastor would be there for two or three years and then they'd find another guy that you know because they hired him to do what they wanted him to do um and that actually was said about me at one time years ago and i'm just kind of too stubborn to give into that kind of stuff because i believe god's called us to something greater i believe he has so i want to leave you with four things and i know we're going to be running late so just hang with me hang with me so four things i want to leave you with real quick first one is this <clears throat> never walk away from Jesus and his mission. Okay? Remember when I said, if I'm wrong? <laughs> and I know you didn't like it when I said that, but it's true. If you don't do this, if you just don't walk away, you're on solid ground. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So never walk away from Jesus and his mission. Never walk away from Jesus and his mission. Just stay tied to it. And I know some of you, some of you are tied to Jesus, but you're forgetting his mission. But you can't separate Jesus from the mission Because that is who Jesus is. Jesus is the mission. You know what I'm saying? Like what he came to do is the mission. So you can't separate these two. So you need to stay tied to them in your life. So how in your life today? Are you tied to Jesus? And then are you tied to his mission? That's the first thing. Number two, we're going to honor the past, but don't try to preserve it. We're going to honor the past. Listen, there are faithful men and women who've gone before us. We stand on their shoulders. We stand on their shoulders and we celebrate their faithfulness in all that they've done. Amen. Amen. But we are not going to try to preserve it. The church is not intended to look like it was 50 years ago because the church is an organism that changes. And listen, understand me. I'm not saying, okay, the problem that we all have is that we look at the church like, well, that church has lights, and some churches have fog machines. We don't have that. Um, but they have music. They have, and, and everybody tries to judge and say they look just like the world looks. Someone told me years ago, they said, well, why does the church look like a nightclub? And I said, I don't know. I've never been to a nightclub. 
But the thing, here's the thing. Here's, and I'm serious. The, the, the problem with all of those things is that's not what Jesus has ever been talking about. What Jesus has been talking about is that you as a people, that me as an individual, that we keep ourselves from being stained by the world. What he's talking about is that we as a people live a life that's set apart from the way the world lives their life. So that we, we look different and we act different and we talk different. And I don't know how many times I have to look at my kids and I have to say, you know, we don't talk like that, right? Because they hear it all around the world. My friends talk like this. My, I know they do. But you know, we don't talk like that, right? Because we follow Jesus. Yeah, okay. That, that's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. But we're going to try to honor the past because there are some incredible people who have gone before us. But the church isn't going to look like it did in 1955. Right? Your home doesn't look like that. McDonald's doesn't serve the same food they did when they first opened. All that stuff changes. The methods of the church will continue to change, but the message will never change. Lean into that a little bit. Okay, next one. You're going to move from preference to significance. So we're going to stop doing things just because we prefer them. We're going to lean into the things that are significant. You and your life are going to do the same. You're going to make this decision that we are going to move from preference to significance. Because there's a world, I actually heard from a guy after the first service that he, he serves in the, the industry that, would know this but he said every month there are at least a hundred families that are moving into Beaufort County or Pooler Georgia <laughs> let that sit for a minute how fast and how rapid our community is growing around us and if we are going to hold on to our preference because I, I get it like I don't like to drive down May River Road and be stuck in traffic I hate it and I don't like to follow the people that go 35 miles an hour please at least go the speed limit public service announcement you know what I'm saying <laughs> <laughs> we're going to move from preference to we're going we're gonna to lean into the things of significance because listen I, don't, I believe this about you you don't maybe believe this but I believe that God has strategically positioned you in your place of influence to be on mission with him whatever that looks like I mean if you're man if you're driving a truck you're driving a truck for jesus you know if you're mowing grass you're mowing grass for jesus you know what i'm saying like you are on mission with him if you're a school teacher if you're you know if you're cleaning out porta johns i mean it doesn't matter we can do anything in the world and be on mission with jesus it's fantastic stuff everything that you do in your life gets redeemed when you're following jesus absolutely everything and then the last thing i want to leave you is this you're going to move from living um, faithless to being faith-filled. So you're going to live faith-filled instead of faithless. Here's the thing. Some of you, if we look at your life today, there's nothing that speaks to you living a life of faith. You've made money. You're successful. You live in a nice house. You have a nice car. You know what you're going to do today. You know what you're going to do tomorrow. You have your whole week planned out. It's written down in your day timer. You're not going to veer from it. There's nothing that speaks to living a life of faith. But did you know? Did you know that without faith, it is impossible to please God? So while you're out there and you think that you're living this life that's pleasing to him, but he says, listen, without faith, it's impossible to please me. And some of you have been living a faithless life since the moment you started following Jesus. The only thing that speaks to faith is your eternity. But God says, listen, I have all of your life here in this world still. And I'm inviting you, I'm inviting you to live faith-filled with it. Faith-filled, to step into this unknown because he's called you to it. To say, listen, there's this stirring in my heart and I don't know why, but I'm just going to step into it because that's what he's doing in my life and I don't have all the answers, which by the way, I am perfectly okay to not know all the answers to the future. I don't have to know what my tomorrow holds because I know the one who holds tomorrow. I don't have to have the answers when we step into this moment because if Jesus has called us to it, he's going to take care of it. And see, some of you, some of you have never experienced the wonder of stepping out in faith. 
You've never experienced the wonder and the awe that comes just to saying, yes, Lord. I have friends that have, they're leaving their job and they're moving into another job and they don't know, they don't have the answers, they don't have it all figured out. I know people that have sold homes and are selling houses and they're moving, all because they just know that the Holy Spirit of God started stirring something in them and they decided that they were gonna live full of faith instead of living a life that's faithless. And he's inviting you to do the same, that you would live a life filled with faith, stepping into the unknown. Because see, one of the things that happens in dead churches is they stop dreaming about what's to come and they stop living by faith. They start making decisions and operating in this realm that we look at and we can see and feel and touch and know Jesus is going, no, 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 I got something more for you. Come on, come on, come on. Step out in faith. Believe me. Believe, believe what I can do. Believe, believe what, what I have in store for you. Because I'm telling you, I, I believe this. I believe God has great things in store for us as we walk in obedience to the things that he's called us to as a people. And it's just fun to sit back and watch as God works. Listen, we're going to close our time because I have gone way too long. So I'm going to ask you to stand. Our prayer team is going to come down front. And they're here to pray with you and for you and over you and whatever it is that you are facing in your life. Hey, you might just need someone that you want to talk to. What does this faith look like? Any of those types of questions, this team is ready and willing and able to meet with you and pray with you. We're going to sing this song. It's called Jesus Paid It All. And it's an important song for us because at the very end of it, it says uh, there's this little tag. We're going to talk about how um, we're going to be in awe of the one who gave his life and has raised us from the dead. So if there's this little flame, this little ember, this little, and he's going to start fanning that flame and we're going to watch as he calls us back to life as a people. Father, we love you. You're so good and pure and right, and we, we, we just stand on your promises and in your word. Thank you for loving us and caring about us, so much so that you're calling us back. Thank you, Father, for being patient when we failed. Thank you for breathing life when we seem lifeless. Help us in this moment to just look at our life, know the steps that we need to take, God, to walk in obedience to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.